It's a pleasure to be in Vancouver, uh, being surrounded by so many ambitious people with a very high ambition level when it comes to research, to teaching, and as I found out painfully also when it comes to hiking, <laughs> uh, the grind and the chief trail, and so my ambition level has also risen in the very few days that I've been here. And uh, you may find it interesting to note that when it comes to creativity, ambition level is also one of the determining factors. Right? Uh, fortunately, we have over 50 years of research into what makes a team creative and uh, a high ambition level is one of them. But unfortunately, we also have 50 years of ignoring <laughs> the results <laughs> of science in practice. So my talk is called The Science and Practice of Team Creativity because I also would like to bridge uh, these two areas where there's really a, cha a chasm between what we know works from research and what is practiced in managerial everyday life, and I would say also in many uh, universities. Because it was more than 50 years ago that Osborne invented brainstorming, in 1954 about, and already in 1958 the first study showed it doesn't work. <laughs> and since then there have been literally dozens of rigorous studies that have shown not only that it doesn't work, but also why it does not work. But our own surveys among managers, hundreds of them, show that if managers know only one creativity technique, and most of them only know one, <laughs> it is brainstorming, unfortunately. <laughs> and they practice it and they have this pseudo feeling of being very creative with their teams. Well, I'm here to tell you today <laughs> that this pseudo feeling is really no only a pseudo feeling, that you're not being creative, that you're not harnessing the full potential of your team, if you employ these infamous four rules of brainstorming, of which the most detrimental is no criticism, please. Right? And that's per perhaps that's also one reason why none of the Hollywood studios, the creative industries, use brainstorming. We actually studied what they use, and they use everything but brainstorming because they know the best way to turn a good idea into a great idea is by exposing it to criti criticism. And not later at some evaluation stage, but right away when you can react to it spontaneously. So, um, as Ian has said, uh, I'm at the uh, business school at the University of St. Gallen uh, in Switzerland, where I'm heading an institute for media and communications management. So, our primary research subjects are indeed managers. We don't uh, uh, use students um, for experiments, we use real-life managers and some of the insights I'm about to share with you come from that, from using usually experienced executives and trying to get them to be creative and doing so in different conditions, under different experimental conditions, so as to find out how can we really get uh, them going. Um, and my personal connection to this topic is an interesting one. Because I didn't used to be interested in creativity, I used to work in strategy and knowledge management. But then once I was in a class, actually taking a class, and we were given the Torrance test. Has anyone in here heard of the Torrance test? It's, it's, okay, one person, great. It's the gold standard when it comes to actually testing you for your creative abilities. It's like the IQ test for creativity. And it's a really fun test to do, and I did it, right? And to my own surprise, because I thought, you know, creativity is for the very few gifted, for the artists, for the talented, I really aced that test. I was like off the charts creative and I had never known <laughs> that I would be a p creative person. And then with the joy came a lot of uh, consternation because I thought, hey, wait a minute, if I'm so creative, how come when I'm in my team, I get always the same old ideas? How come if I'm really that creative, apparently, to the, according to the Torrance test, then I can't get my team to be creative? And I realized that it's fundamentally different to be a creative person than to be cr a creative leader and to empower your team to really get the best ideas out. And that's what I would like to talk about today. Not just individual genius, but really the team, uh, the team's creative abilities, your ability to lead a group to better ideas. And for that we also have to talk a little bit about the problems that usually impede teams from harvesting their full uh, creativity. Now just for those of you who think maybe this topic is not so central, and you're from the BD Business School, let me just uh, share two recent survey stats with you that I found very interesting, where IBM regularly surveyed about 1,700 CEOs about what the most important leadership traits are for the next five years. 
And to my own surprise, what regularly comes up in the top two is creativity, right? More than, more than half of the managers, 60% say that's the most important leadership uh, quality or together with uh, collaborative, communicative, in a, in a more recent study, again, creativity. So it's le really what we ask from our leaders as a leadership trait. But then when you look at the curriculum of business schools today, we don't really find a lot of that. In effect, if you look what our schools are doing, a lot of them are destroying creativity rather than fostering it. So I think this is a really important area of research, of teaching, and of everyday practice. And uh, the CEOs, certainly, they uh, demand it. So uh, I would like to um, show, share with you, because I'm Swiss and we like to plan, like a, uh, a plan with you uh, this so short sessions. Uh, I've already talked about the importance of creativity in, in management. Of course, it's also instrumental to such areas as product development, uh, problem solving, any kind of opportunity creation, especially in entrepreneurship, where we use a lot of our creativity techniques. I want to talk a little bit more about suboptimal creativity practices like using brainstorming and then in a second step really give you a bit of a synthesis of all the studies and there are literally dozens of them that show that brainstorming doesn't work and why it doesn't work. And also a few other blockers to creativity. And I want to show you um, our own research that shows how alternatives have to be designed that they work for optimal reverberation in the team. Some just insights into experimental research that helps us design better ideation sessions. But then it says also, not just the science, it also says in the title, the practice, I want to show you the three essential phases for creativity to work, the preparation, production, and idea polishing phase, why warm-up exercises are key, because you can't just, just flip a switch and then you're suddenly creative, you need to get into this mindset. And I would like to share with you five simple principles that we've been able to find in synthesizing, synthesizing the literature from the last 50 years. And last but not least, I'd like to share with you some useful, simple alternatives to brainstorming that are based on visualization and that really help you engage your team members and uh, dig into their creative potential and help them have better ideas together where they also build on each other's ideas. And some of them you may know, some of them are quite new. And then I'd like to wrap it up and hopefully then we'll have an interesting uh, discussion on some of these controversial issues. So um, don't believe me when I say we should ban the brainstorming. I mean I've researched this for now about 15 years. Uh, I've written in, the, in Europe the number one bestseller on it, but don't believe me. <laughs> believe <laughs> some, believe uh, Dilbert when he says the following. So the boss says, who wants to go first with the brainstorming? And Dilbert raises his hand and says, I suggest we ignore all of the studies that say brainstorming doesn't work. Right? And then the boss replies, I hate you a little extra now. And he says, because I agreed with your plan. And you should not. You should not. Brainstorming is a bad idea. It is popular because it is of the utmost simplicity. You can just shout out your idea. Quality is more important than quantity. You can just, if you're an introvert, enjoy the show because the extroverts will usually take over at that point, right? And you don't have to worry about implementation because usually most of the ideas that come up are so out of the box you can never get them back into it, right? You can never make it work with the real life constraints that you're facing. So what does Dilbert refer to? Here's just a, a big uh, a bit of the data. Let's first look at some of the performance data. And I just picked one study uh, that we used for one infographics. It, it's, I could have done, uh, taken any other, even more recent studies. They always show the same result. And which results do they show? Well, when you compare face-to-face -face brainstorming in a group with individual, as it's called, nominal group ideation, the numbers are quite clear when it comes to quantity and idea quality. So, face-to-face -face brainstorming groups in this study, it was a fairly well done study, they came up with 28 ideas whereas the same number of people working independently, you could call this solitary brainstorming, they came up with a lot more ideas, just quantity wise. And Osborne was right, quantity of ideas does lead to quality of ideas, so it matters, this fluency aspect. But then they also 
had independent coders sort of rank the quality of the ideas. And this is where it's really astonishing that people, when they work independently, actually come up with a lot better ideas than if they engage in group brainstorming. And there are many, many studies that have replicated this result. And now let's look at why this is the case. Let's look at how come people generate better ideas in this so-called nominal group mode when they first write it down, then when they go into sharing mode right away. The first thing that scientists have found out is so-called production blocking. I don't know it is how it is for you, but I have a really hard time coming up with a great idea while I have to listen to a colleague of mine telling his <laughs> or hers, right? It's th that's really hard to do, but that is exactly what brainstorming asks us to do. And scientists call this production blocking, when my production of good ideas is blocked by others trying to share theirs, right? So in brainstorming, it's really hard to concentrate and to come up with a good idea to a complex problem because all of your mental attention or most of your focus is directed towards somebody else telling theirs, right? But then there's the other downside, you don't really build on each other because you're not always fully listening because you're trying to articulate that idea that you have in your head. So production blocking is a big problem of brainstorming and you can already reduce it by switching from brainstorming to brain writing. Asking your colleagues to first write down in their idea and then share it. Which is, by the way, a practice that a lot of companies are starting to adopt now. To name but a few, Amazon is doing that. Silent meetings. LinkedIn is doing it. Procter & Gamble is doing it. Right? There's a second big issue that you can reduce if you um, switch from brainstorming to a more visual or written form of ideation. What I call premature contamination, which means that whenever people gather to do brainstorming, there's the following mechanism happening. The first person who yells out his or her idea contaminates everybody else to think in one direction. And you can't really, you know, immunize yourself from that. The first person will, by their answer, give the others a frame of reference, a sort of way of looking at the problem. And it will inevitably destroy the idea diversity that you would otherwise have in the room. Right? So switching from brainstorming to brain writing is a good way to reduce this mutual and instant contamination problem. Right? And it is hard. We just did a creativity a workshop this morning. Um, and there's this tendency for people, it was again in the room, it was 40-year-old entrepreneurs, very creative, but they wanted to yell it out. And I told them this rule at the very beginning, please first write it down and then say it. But there's something in us, we would just want to get it out. And it, it happened in that workshop this morning as well. Somebody just yelled out their idea. And then what do you have? The others are contaminated. They find it hard to let go of that initial idea and they follow the same sort of train of thought. And that's too bad because what do we want most in an ideation session? We want to profit from the diversity that's in the room. You don't have that when you go to brainstorming mode. I don't want to turn this into a Woody Allen movie where for hours we just talk about problems, <laughs> although in, a, in an entertaining manner, but I hope you bear with me just with a few, the top maybe five or six problems of brainstorming. We could go on with this. I just want to focus on the key parts here. And, and number three is one I already mentioned that brainstorming appeals to a lot of bosses, leaders, managers, because they're extroverts. They like it, they strive on this. They like to, you know, just rapid fire ideas. But guess what? Those people who have the really good ideas because they have the detailed problem knowledge that's necessary to have good ideas, they don't enjoy that. They're introverts. They, they have a hard time getting in their word, you know, especially when their boss is talking. So they just sit back and enjoy the show. And so you have free riding, social loafing, that they say, you know, let the extroverts take over. We'll just uh, listen and, and, and see what happens. When you sm switch to brain writing or other visual or written forms, everybody must contribute. Uh, you just then check what everybody has written down, and so even the introverts have their say, and you can sort of immunize the group from the dominance of a few extroverts. Next, really big design flaw. Right? 
of brainstorming, why, why, why I think it's time for a product recall, or better yet, to put it into retirement for sure, brainstorming. There's this, out of these four rules, you know, quantity before quality, try to build on each other, um, um, don't hold anything back. The, the most prominent and usually most well-known rule of brainstorming is no criticism allowed. And of course it's good, we're so much self-censoring ourselves anyhow, that there's no killer phrases, like we've tried that before or that will never work. You should try to have a constructive atmosphere. But you can do that while still criticizing. So this rule, no criticism, is really foregoing a lot of chances to turn a good idea into a great idea. And when we studied how Hollywood writers go about creativity in their writing teams, we found that they actually have very clear rules on how to criticize one another. But they all criticize one another, ruthlessly so, really. Criticism is seen as the key tool for creativity. So it is ironic that in the creativity technique that managers use most, critique has no place. And that's uh, really a serious design flaw in this methodology. And you will learn about alternatives uh, during this short presentation. And then my personal favorite, this belief that by simply throwing a question out there, you magically enable everybody to get in this creative mood. Right? Brainstorming does not help you get into that creative mode. It does not notch you towards new problem perspectives. It doesn't help you to think about the issue from a different angle. But that's what great creativity techniques do. For example, one of my favorite techniques, as simple as brainstorming but much more effective, the flip-flop technique, where you start with asking people of how to make things worse. So for example, not how can we win more clients, but actually you ask them, how can we drive away every single client we have? Not how we get, can we get more scientific publications at the BD school, no, how can we reduce them to zero? What would we have to do to reduce our scientific output to zero? Right? And you would be surprised that this simple reframing technique leads to not only people really enjoying it, I don't know, there's something devious in us, <laughs> but actually producing very good ideas when then again you flip them again. When you say, okay, now what would be the exact opposite of those detrimental ideas we've just come up with? And then there's an additional benefit, you actually learn what you should stop doing because it hurts you, right? So uh, this lack of stimuli is really another serious disadvantage of brainstorming. And I do hope these make sense. I could go on, but I just leave it here with the big five. Now, I want to share with you a little bit of research that we've done. So the existing body of knowledge says brainstorming does not work as well as brain writing. People, when they individually produce ideas, are much better than if they share it directly. We know that much. But we don't know actually how brain writing is best enabled. So we did a study where we did brain writing always with diets, with two people, because there's a lot of research that shows the best unit for ideation is not a team of five, of four, of three, no, it's pairs. If you want to boost your creativity meetings, have your people split up into pairs. That seems to be one of the most effective forms of joint ideation. Of course, still one person writing down their ideas before sharing it, but then exchanging it in pairs of two. And we've done that online in a, just a blank shared space where blue is person number one and orange is person uh, number two. And they first write down their ideas and then they share them. And we said, maybe when you do that, how you represent the ideas matters. And I just had this idea based on another study that we had done that such simple things as the bullet point shape may have an impact. And guess what we found? I will show you the numbers in a second. Significant impact. Here's what happened. So we let tons of people ideate together in pairs, online, in brain writing mode. First writing down their ideas, then checking what the other person has, combining it, and getting to better ideas in the process, right? They worked on uh, different kinds of problems. And what we found was very interesting. In half of the conditions, we used very sketchy bullet points in the system. In the other, we used very polished bullet points. And it turns out that whenever we used sketchy bullet points, people built on each other a lot more than we, when we used polished bullet points. 
Because we found from uh, studies we had done on PowerPoint that the more polished your slides, the less discussion there is. <laughs> right? The more polished your PowerPoint presentation, the more people have this museum effect of, oh, this looks so pretty, this is certainly right. right? <laughs> and when they, go into, when they go into sketching mode, when they go to a flip chart or a whiteboard, this is when the great discussions happen. And so we had this intuition that maybe if we make software look less polished, the technical term is perceived finishedness. When the perceived finishedness is very low, they will build on each other's more. And guess what? We were right. So I just want to show a, a little bit of the numbers. They're quite astonishing for various things. Let me just uh, tell you what you're seeing here. So perceived finishedness <coughs> means how sketchy does it look. If something has low perceived finishedness, it means it looks very sketchy, like the icon I just uh, showed you. And every time we used in these many, many diets, teams of two, an icon with low perceived finishedness, people had more ideas where they both collaborated on. They also scored high when we had independent coders rank the creativity, the feasibility and originality of their ideas to problems. It was usually for a given problem. Uh, can you come up with solutions? Their creativity was always higher. You can see that very clearly here when they worked with something as arbitrary, it may seem, as an unfinished icon. By the way, we also checked for typeface, did not have significant uh, results. And we also found that this matters, that you build on each other's ideas, because it made the ideas more feasible. Those ideas where they actually collaborated upon were later judged by our independent coders to be much more feasible, implementable. So it's really good if people build on each other's ideas because it makes their ideas more useful. And interesting, so, so we took the existing research one step further. <coughs> we know from 50 years of research, brain writing is better than brainstorming. But we don't know actually how to tweak brain writing. What we found out is, especially <coughs> if, you look, if you use computers, make it look provisional. And we didn't make it look to have a low perceived finishedness, like the, the icon you see here. Don't make it look too polished. When something looks finished, people perceive it as finished, and they don't add to it. And in creativity, you want to keep things in flux. And then we did a second experiment where we used dyadic mind mapping, where we said, you can do brain writing on a mind map. So we gave people large mind maps where one person was generating ideas on the left, while the second person was generating ideas on the right. And then we had them switch places and add to their ideas, now combine to their ideas. It was brain writing mode, visual again. And what we found was the same effect. When we had produced a nice mind map structure for them, they didn't build on each other. When they had to draw their own messy mind maps and it looked very sketchy, they had no such reservation. They really built on each other a lot. So when it comes to ideation, I guess my advice is that. Make it look ugly. Make it look ugly, because it will um, reduce people's propensity, it will enhance people's propensity to build on each other. It will create more reverberation. Right? That's what we found based on our research using real-life managers. Right? And I just want to mention a few of the reasons why we think that works. So we've, what we've done in here in, in for one of our books is sort of a, the, the seven, or, or the, the, sorry, the five top reasons why people are not creative. So the, the different dead ends. And what we found is the way you visualize your ideas helps reduce them. So the first trap that we usually encounter, especially with managers, is what we call the status quo trap. People prefer how it is to how it could be. So there's a natural tendency against creativity. But when they use sketching or other provisional forms, they become much more fluid. They, 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 they say, it's just a sketch. Let's try out how it could be. So it reduces uh, the status quo. Mutual uh, interference. The first person determines the direction of the development of ideas. Again, already with brain writing, we can solve that. If you visualize your ideas on one side while the other person on another, and then you combine. That's much better than if you just yell it out. Or premature commitment to an idea. That's another problem we found with managers, that whenever in brainstorming sessions somebody comes up with an idea that is sort of new and sort of feasible, they say, yeah, that's it, let's go, let's run. Right? They, they fall in love with their first idea. But when you look at studies of really creative people, what is it that makes them so creative? 
It is their resistance to go with their first idea and their really relentlessness to polish their ideas and to try to come up with new ideas again and again. What Dr. Lubick did the other day when I was sitting in her class is she had uh, students draw out their best three ideas about a problem they were given and then they had to tear up those ideas and throw them away and do it again. Draw, sketch three of their ideas and then again tear it up, it was full of paper at the end in the room, and throw it away and come up again with new ideas. And that's, I think, what you need to have in a good creativity technique. The ability to sustain this process, to go on and not to have, as the scientists call it, premature commitment to your first ideas. And I think when you have a visual look that signals work in progress, like a sketch, then you have that and you can keep this uh, creative energy go, uh, going longer. And we also showed that people work longer on a visual when, when it's sketchy than when it's polished. That's another finding we, we did not uh, expect. And the last two typical creativity problems that lead you astray in the creative process, free riding and low ambition, when you're just pairing up people and you can visually see who contributed how many ideas, that really reduces free riding when there's a visual sort of testament of your contributions, then everybody knows, oh, I better get my act together and contribute, otherwise my side of the mind map, for example, looks completely empty. So that's another way you can trick people into what's good for them. Not so easy it is with the fifth point. This is probably the biggest barrier to creativity in management. It's a problem that we've known in psychology for a while, it's called functional fixedness, that you see something only as one thing and have a hard time <coughs> changing your view about it. And the flip-flop method I, I, I just mentioned to you, that's one way to get around that. But functional fixedness is, is very hard. It's, it's the experience you have that, for example, the competition is your enemy and only your enemy. And it makes no sense trying to cooperate with them. That would be an example of functional fixedness. What we've been able to see is that when you give groups of managers warm-up exercises, they can overcome that functional fixedness. Warm-up exercises such as write down 10 new ways 10 new uses for a paper clip. You know, then th that helps them overcome this functional fixedness. Or an exercise we've done with the entrepreneurs this morning, write down six ways in which you can make money with a cow without milking it or butchering it, without using its milk or meat. And they came up with great ways of using uh, uh, cows, you know, from uh, having it uh, as a sort of a uh, a YouTube sensation and uh, making it a marketing vehicle to renting it out at kids parties uh, for lame rodeos uh, <laughs> they came up with a lot of ideas to, to use uh, cows and the exercise purpose was to help them to see one thing from many angles right? and I think that's a prerequisite uh, for creativity uh, in general so what does work? Here's what didn't work so we tried to sort of summarize everything we had learned from our experiments and from the literature in a little diamond. Um, because like a diamond, you know, ideas are often in the rough and you have to really cut away what's essential and what's not and you have to polish it first and foremost to get a great idea. And, and here's what we learned in a nutshell. It makes sense to structure the creative process in a team into three phases and you can't do less than that. You need to begin with a warm-up like the ones I just mentioned the cow exercise, the paperclip exercise, or I'll show you a few other tools that are important. It's important to open up the participants. It's also important to give them a chance to let out what's on their mind so that they're really open for the creative process. So you need a sort of a, a preparation phase at the beginning in order to understand the problem that you're working on and get people into the creative mode. Then you need to produce many ideas. Osborne was right about that a lot of diverse ideas, but you need to do so not in brainstorming mode, but individually. And then you can combine them. And thirdly, and we can learn that from a lot of the biographies of creative geniuses, you really have to keep at it. You have to polish the idea. You have to get feedback on the ideas. You have to test them out. Right? The sooner, the better. So you have to switch into creative mode more often. A lot of times it's the manager's fault that they don't even try to come up with new solutions, but they use old solutions that often do not fit. Then you have to enable an atmosphere where everybody feels comfortable about creating and sharing even crazy ideas. And, and by the way, what we found is when you have introverts in the room, they're very shy about sharing their craziest ideas. 
So it makes sense to first pair them up and share it with their neighbor. And then when we, we, we tested this quite rigorously, they're much more willing to share even their crazy ideas because they've already been pre-nodded. Already somebody has given them feedback on it, and so they're much more willing to share it. So pairing up, re, uh, one paper we called uh, pairing, reduces, uh, pairing reduces scaring and increases sharing, because really people are less scared to share even their um, ideas that are crazy. And that's important because they may trigger a great idea with somebody else. And then you really have to get the idea right, you have to combine it in the right way, uh, you have to check that it's feasible. And these are the, the principles that we found. It's first important that you clarify the task of the team. That you know that you're working on the right problem and that you're addressing the root causes. But you can also over-clarify. I mean, this is something that is very unique to creativity. In other areas of management, it is super important to be crystal clear, to be very specific about your expectations. Whereas in creativity, this can be detrimental because it may reduce some of the option space that you have. So you don't want to over-specify the solution, but you want to be sure that everybody understands the problem. Then the second thing that is important before you go into the idea production phase is to challenge a bit the basic assumptions. And I found this personally the hardest part when working with managers. Having them question their own beliefs about what the customer wants, for example. So I will show you a few tools that help you challenge your own assumptions. And it will also help you change your perspectives. Right? Tom Peters, one of the gurus of management, he says, best advice he ever got regarding creativity, hang out with weirdos. <laughs> Surround yourself with people who have a really radically different view on things, on issues, on pressing problems, and they will help you change your perspective. And then as Stephen Jobs has said, creativity is often nothing more than combination. So you want to get the best ideas and combine them in a novel way. To him, according to him, that was the secret to creativity at Apple. And then you want to check your ideas time and time again with different people. You want to seek fe out feedback, get as many diverse opinions on your ideas as possible. Not protect it. And this is where the dual, dual path theory of creativity comes in. When you study um, the personality of creative geniuses, whether entrepreneurs, uh, artists, or what have you, they usually have two traits that not often come together. They're very stubborn, self-confident, and relentless when it comes to pursuing their ideas, while at the same time being extremely flexible in incorporating feedback. And that's what you need to combine in checking your idea. You need to believe in your vision, but you also need to be open enough to incorporate improvement suggestions. And we'll see that in a technique called PPCO, where you do exactly that. So this is our basic framework. Uh, the principles uh, I just talked about, and I'll gladly make these slides available, um, and, and how to sort of use them. Now, of course, a fool with a tool is still a fool, right? I mean, uh, just having a good creativity technique doesn't automatically transform you into, into a creative genius, and also, it's important where you meet. The room is important, actually high ceilings like here is important, um, that you have a lot of, you know, good utensils, instruments, tools to visualize your ideas, that's important. And not the least, the, the people you have in the room. The more diverse your participants, of course, the more diverse your ideas. But if you have that covered, there's a few techniques that you can use. And on our site, creability.ch, we've uh, given you templates of about 30 such tools. And um, this afternoon, I'd just like to share maybe a four or five of them, my personal favorites. And there are most of them are as simple as brainstorming, but they all avoid the pitfalls, the five pitfalls that we have looked at uh, together. So here's a few, some of them, uh, as you can see, are, are simple text-based tools, uh, like Scamper. Uh, some are visual, my favorite ones, and I want to share some of those with you because they provide really great stimuli to be more creative. And some are actually involving the whole body, like innovation walks or body storming. And, and Innovation Walks is an interesting one because it's such a simple idea that we have forgotten, and you know, that Aristotle already knew that he used to develop his ideas walking with students, but then it has somehow forgotten a lost, and now we're rediscovering it with all sorts of fancy names like Innovation Walks or Nordic, Nordic Talking or, <laughs> I don't know, uh, Pathway to Creativity. There's many names for this. And, and a lot of companies are building these little 
walkways into their headquarters like Facebook now did or, or other organizations as well. And the basic idea is very simple. And again, there's a Stanford study to back this up. People have better ideas when they're walking than when they're sitting. So what I sometimes do, and this may not sound very academic, but when, I, when I'm getting stuck with my team, when we have a problem, I say, hey, let's just grab a coffee across the street. And, and, and more times than not, we get a great idea while walking to get the coffee, right? Or, or probably coming back when we had it. <laughs> but it's the walking that enables a different kind of communication. More open, you're less censoring yourself, and there's a different dynamic going on. So I guess the unexpected advice here is take a walk, take a hike. Well, not a hike Canadian style, <laughs> because you still have to be able to breathe and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and think. But um, this is something that I would put in the performative methods. But I want to focus a little bit on the, on the visual ones and show you just how simple and effective, effective some of these tools can be. And here's uh, the first one. This we developed based on an idea by Jim Roth called Dynamic Facilitation. It's called the Perspectives Diagram. And it's extremely simple, but the idea behind it is not. Many times, teams struggle to be truly creative because there are some individuals in the team that is blocking so somehow the collective energy. And why are they blocking it? Usually because there's something that they really want to get out. So it's a good idea to let that out at the beginning of a meeting so that they're more open to the process. And with this kind of diagram, you can do that. You just put it on a flip chart, uh, on a beamer, on a projector, or even on a simple piece of paper will be sufficient. And you say, look, regarding our topic today, you put that in the middle. What open questions do you guys have? What is, a, what is a question that you would really like to discuss? Or is there something you know about this topic that everybody else should know? Because that's usually what people want to get out. There's some fact or insight that they have, and they will not rest until they get it out. And they will always try to, they, they're always waiting for that one moment when they can ask their question, show their knowledge, voice their frustration, something negative that they have experienced about the topic, or something that they really did well, a success story. So the idea behind this tool, a as a preparation tool, right, so it's for that phase one preparation is, give people some space and acknowledge what they want to say. So you just take a post-it note and you put it in there where it belongs, or you use facilitation software like, like Let's Focus or others, to map out what is on people's minds and you get that out of the way. You don't spend a lot of time doing that, maybe 10 minutes, but then you will see the atmosphere that you get is much more open because people have been able to voice a question that they have, share something they know, get something off their chest that really bothered them, or share a success they had. So I think that next to the warm-up exercises is a really good use of your time. Something where you get everybody on the same page and they can just let off steam um, or just, you know, contribute what they have to bring to the table. And it is also a good basis for the further discussion. I yes? Sorry, so when you're doing this and you have your team participate, are you then sharing that information with the rest of the team? Like, I'm, my question is, is that not then getting to the, um, the premature contamination? Yes. Yes, excellent point. You may have noticed that th th there's no slot for ideas or solutions. In Jim Roth's original technique of dynamic facilitation, there is. But we've eliminated that exactly for that reason. So we just focus on questions, facts, negative experiences, or positive experience from the past. We don't go into the idea generation phase at this point, and we make it very clear for exactly that reason. We don't want it to, to prematurely contaminate people into one way of thinking. This is just an, a 360 overview. Uh, excellent question. But if you look at the original method, dynamic facilitation by Jim Roth, he includes that, solutions. But I think that's, that's a bad idea because of contamination, that you get into a, a single direction too quickly. And um, it doesn't take a, a, a long time. You can do this uh, quite quickly. If you want a more playful way uh, to do this, just, you know, if you have kids the night before the workshop or the meeting, just go through their room and get, collect some toys go through your kitchen, collect some stuff, or your office, and then put it on the table at the beginning of the meeting and say, please everyone grab an object and tell us what this has to do with our topic today. 
And so people can really, they're, they're very good at this, spontaneously create a connection between something they've experienced, something they know or a question they have, and an object. And it makes already for a much more creative atmosphere. Because that's important when you start a meeting, uh, you want to also set a bit the creative tone of that endeavor. Yes, please. How do you think that the, the de Bono methods of the thinking six hats into this framework? Yes, I think the six thinking hats is an excellent technique to change perspectives, right? And also to get people maybe out of their standard mode. Um, and I think it's great for the idea production phase, uh, not so much for the preparation. In the six thinking hats, for those of you who've never tried it, you're forced to take on one role, for example, the criticizer, or the, the person who always finds something positive to say, or, or the person who tries to, you know, inspire the emotional uh, aspect, or the person who uh, keeps control of the planning and the timing and so forth. And it makes sense to have different roles. So I, I would agree with that, but again, it depends how you use it. In, in, the, in the yell it out, say it out loud mode, I think it could be detrimental, right? But I, I think it is a method with a lot of merit. And actually, when we checked what creativity techniques do managers actually know, the bonus thinking ads was in the top five. Right. All right, let me show you a few other techniques that have come to be quite popular. It's really quick. Um, with regards to the, the diagram to show, is there any, um, best to use in terms of the size of the group because I can just imagine if you're if it's you're trying to get at those negative experiences and if it's a you're saying 10 minutes would be an appropriate yes. time I'm just thinking like does it matter in terms of the size or what what works best because oh, if it's a large yeah. group I can just imagine that that could go on and on forever you I think I've used a method for as little as three people and as many as 25 it's just a facilitation approach changes so when you have 25 people you really have to do it rapid fire mode Right? And it's also important that you manage expectations, right? that you say, look, this is not a problem-solving tool. I just want to read the room a little and you know, get out what's on your mind. And then you can do it in rapid-fire mode. And then you say, everybody, just one contribution, please, whether it's a question, an experience, uh, something you already know about the topic, and then you focus them. So you, I think it's a method that allows you quite a, a range of participants. But you have to, of course, adapt your facilitation approach to it. Here's another technique that uh, does a little bit what the Bono thinking hat does. It forces you to change your perspective. Who in here has heard of the empathy map before? Raise your hand. Or I would say about a quarter. That's great. Uh, it's a method, uh, I think David Gray originally uh, invented it, that helps you to switch your sort of frame of mind into the customer's point of view. And what you do is, with this simple technique, uh, usually uh, you can do it with software, but you can also just quickly draw it uh, on a flip chart, a nose, you know, an eye, an ear. That's basically uh, all you need in the mouth. And then you say, this customer, from the customer's point of view, what is he seeing about this topic? What is he perceiving or she about this issue that we're discussing? How does this problem look from the customer's eyes? What has he last received from us? So you start with what the customer is perceiving and seeing that you then move over to what he's hearing from his colleagues, his social context. What are the rumors about this issue? What is he getting from the press? What are, is the competition saying about this issue? You really try to have a 360 on your customer's perception. What is he saying about this topic? What are typical quotes from the customer about this that could tell us something about his, uh, you know, his different uh, attitudes or, or questions? And last but not least, up here, what are his beliefs? What are his worries? What are his hopes? What are his open questions? You really try, as the American Indians say it, to walk a mile in the moccasins of your, your, your customer, right? See the world from his eyes, which I think is a great preparation exercise for creativity, to let go of your own point of view. And then down here is a little section that uh, was added, added later, the red one being the pain points of your customer, what frustrates the hell out of him, what is really making his life miserable, for example, in interacting with your service or your product, and what are the gain points. Gain as to say, what, how can we make his life easier? How can we help him uh, you know, solve a particular problem? So down here you would have gain points, ways in which we can help the customer solve his or her problems, and here we have the pain points, what is irritating the customer. Right? And I found this tool very useful to collect in a really rapid manner the knowledge of your team about the customer. 
Of course, this only makes sense if you have knowledge about the customer. If you have, uh, regarding this point, really quotes that the customer has said, if you can uh, really envision what are the questions that this customer has about the issue, what are his worries, what are her beliefs and feelings about this. But then it becomes a really good preparation exercise to switch perspectives and get into the mind of the customer. Does this make sense to you? And because it's visual, you can also connect it, you can document it, and usually already this exercise creates a lot of ideas of how to better serve the customer. Maybe let me share with you one more really useful creativity technique, in spite of it having originated at the Harvard Business School. <laughs> <laughs> Where maybe simplicity is not always uh, top of mind, but this is really simple because it basically works by just drawing three, arrow, three circles, very, very simple. Three circles, one representing the customer again, and you can use what you have done in the empathy map, one representing your own company, and the third one, the competition. And here's how you use those three circles. And when I've used it, for example, with a large insurance group to invent new insurance business models for the internet age, we've seen that it really creates great discussions and great ideas. You begin with the sweet spot, which is, of course, things that you can offer the client that the competition cannot. So the sweet spot zone in this little Venn diagram is this area right here, right? Where you can offer something that the client really wants that the competition cannot offer at this point in time. And what you discuss is how can we exploit these unique selling propositions more systematically. That's the first sort of phase in this visual creativity technique. But again, first you write it down individually, then you share it, for example, on a whiteboard. What are we great at that the customer values? That's where you start. And it's always good in creativity session, in any creativity session, to start with the positive, to start with what works. You know, positive psychology. Build on what works. So you don't want to start with the negative. I think that's true for many good creativity techniques. Start in a positive mood. And you continue on that and say, secondly, what exclusive characteristics of our offer are not yet used for the client benefit and how can we get them into the sweet spot zone, right? Which capabilities are we not yet using for the client's benefits and how could we do so? What are we great at but a customer doesn't even know it? How can we make him care about this? And then thirdly, this is a very interesting zone down here, what are latent needs of the customer that maybe he doesn't know or she doesn't know that he has? And how can we get them into the sweet spot zone? For example, I didn't know I needed an iPad on my lap while watching a TV uh, soccer match, right? <laughs> that was a latent need I didn't know I had. I didn't know I wanted a second screen while watching TV to chat or to uh, you know, access additional information. But somehow, through very, very smart uh, viral advertising, I realized I really have that need. <laughs> I now want something on my lap, a tablet, I mean, when watching TV. So that's the third thing, and that's where the empathy map can really help you. But then we can go on. For example, I find this area very interesting. Because a good creativity technique should not only give you what you should do additionally, but also what you should stop, like the flip-flop technique. And that's your fourth area right over here. Because these are things which the competition is offering, which your company is offering, but the client doesn't really care about. So what you can put here are ideas of what should we stop doing because it no longer provides any value. For example, I just the other day I received another hefty package in, the, in, in my mail with a phone book. Who needs phone books? Makes no sense whatsoever, right? Stop sending me a phone book. But sometimes companies are set in their ways and they don't question some of the things that, you know, everybody's doing it. Well, creativity is exactly about that, questioning your basic assumptions and what you should stop doing. And when you've had a good time with this technique and you've enjoyed yourself, then it's time to face the hard reality, namely there's also a sour spot. Things that your competition can offer the client that he or she really wants, but you are unable to, whether it's a better price, a broader range of products, a better service quality, you need to confront that 
And you need to think about, well, how can we get this into the playing field? How can we replicate that capability? And it's also a good discussion to have. And so this is a, a little method, the sweet spot, that is extremely simple and if used in the right manner can really harness a lot of the creativity of your team. Just going through these five uh, simple steps. And what I think is, is nice about it, and uh, this has happened with quite a few visual tools I've used in companies, people appropriate it. So in one company I've used it, they said, hey, let's add another circle about our partners and, and look at the implications of our partners. And that's okay. Uh, you know, creativity tools are not medication that you have to use exactly in the right way. You can appropriate them however you want to and make them your own in the process. Here's another tool and, and then I think I'll, I'll wrap it up. Uh, this one is uh, called the, the One-Armed Association Bandit and uh, it worked really great. Uh, we developed it ourselves. It really worked great in some contexts when you have the feeling people are already warmed up and they're, they're a creative crowd. Here's what you do. You give them the problem and then you ask them to randomly pick three terms, one from each column, right? And first think individually, as always, what message does that term have for my problem? What solution, uh, the abridged anti-connector, how does that help me win new clients, right? Is there something uh, where I can make the process quicker, where um, anti-connectors are maybe people who separate clients? Is there a way I can bring clients together so they get more value out of the product? And can I make that quicker that they find somebody? So for example, if I buy a, a squash racket or a tennis racket, maybe I get a automatically matched up with a partner of my same, same skill level, right? And, and, and can play tennis actually with somebody, not just buying the racket, but getting a partner to play with. You know, you just work on your associations. And if that first term here didn't, didn't do it for you, you just pull this again and you pick three other terms. Right? And then you share that with your partner. But you first ask him what he associates or she associates with the term and then you share your idea and you get feedback. And I found this, you use it for 10 minutes to be a very productive, rapid idea generation tool. But again, you have to use it first individually. You write it down and then you share it. But you have, unlike in brainstorming, a notch to be creative. You have a push, you have this stimulation through these random words. And these are words that we developed because they really, they maximize resonance. They really let you think of a lot of different solution aspects. And they get you into solution mode as well. And, and as I said, you can download this tool and others at our site, creability.ch. Uh, that is also available uh, in English and you find about 20 of these tools online. Now, I've already talked about the flip-flop method. Just want to mention it again. Not all great creativity techniques are visual, right? You can also take something as simple as this one. And what I like about this one, you can make creativity a habit. Creativity is not a gift. It's not genetic. Creativity is a habit. And I've worked with one German retailer. They put this method into every meeting that they have. So they always do a flip-flop at the end. Just to be sure, they've explored all their options. They invert the problem, so instead of make, solving the problem, how can we make it, make it worse? They generate destructive ideas individually, as you should. Then they share them. They identify things that they're actually doing of this list, which is always a sort of an epiphany moment. And then they flip-flop these ideas to get good solutions. They just do the opposite. Right? What would be the opposite of these bad ideas? And so within five minutes, you've generated great ideas that exceed the quality of a, what you get from a brainstorming session by far. And it's fun. People enjoy it. Yes? I don't know if you're familiar with the TV show Seinfeld. Yeah, I remember <laughs> Seinfeld. Well, there's an episode which George Costanza has the opposite rule. Mm -hmm. He goes through life and he decides to change his life. He'll think about the decision he was going to make, and it's the complete opposite. And he finds that, uh, and so often that's, that's quite a practice in terms of uh, where if you want to go in a different direction, it's called the George Costanza rule. You just do the opposite of what you have been doing, and generally it has better outcomes if you want to go in a different direction. Yep. It's a good way to force yourself to change your view, to change your mind, right? And sometimes we need such radical rules. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, maybe one last uh, element that I've mentioned. We don't just need tools for generating ideas, we also need tools on how to evaluate them. 
And here's one of the best techniques in terms of impact that I've come across. And we found it when we studied how, for example, Hugh Laurie and others, how they work together when writing new episodes for House MD or for, for Lost or CSI. They have a few really great rules when they work in a, what is called in Hollywood a writer's room. One rule, for example, is the baby writer rule. The baby writer rule states that whoever's the least senior person in the room gets to share his or her ideas first which I think is a great rule for managers as well, right? That whoever is, has been with the company the least amount of time should first voice their ideas, of course, after everybody has written it down, so that they don't feel shy to introduce something new, so that they don't have this tendency to just second the opinion of the boss, and so that the boss actually listens to the fresh ideas of people who come from the outside. And the second rule that I really like is the PPCO feedback mechanism. And I practice this with my student a lot and I've seen the results it can bring. It means that whenever you have an idea, you have to expose it to the criticism of your colleagues, but they have to be constructive. The colleagues that criticize you have to do so constructively, meaning they have to first tell you what they like about the idea. So they have to take a moment and say, you know, there's a lot of merit in your idea, I really like this aspect, it won't cost us a lot, for example. And they have to go further, they have to think about where this idea could be applicable elsewhere. They have to acknowledge the potential of the idea. And only when they've done that quickly can they articulate their main concern. You know, I really like this idea, it's inexpensive to implement, we could even use this in our customer serv service department, but I think you will find it difficult to get buy-in from top management for it, for this and this reason. But you can't stop at this point, and this is why Pixar and Disney, they call this the plussing method. You have to add something to your criticism, namely a direction in which it could be overcome, the criticism. So maybe you can help uh, overcome this concern of lacking management buy-in by showing the management where else this has been applied and how it worked, right? So you have to give the person that you're criticizing an a sort of a help how to improve the idea. And this has changed the atmosphere in many ideation workshops that I've been in. And we leave this on the board, on a whiteboard, as a permanent reminder of what it means to give good criticism. And then we also have a tool where this is implemented visually. It's called the iteration spiral, where you write your idea on your side of the table, and then the other person criticizes it, but gives you a hint on how to improve it. And then it's back to you, and you, you do a second version of your idea, and then it goes back to them. And so you have a really rapid improvement loop. And we found that this is much more constructive than generating a long list of ideas that nobody comments upon because, as you know in brainstorming, criticism is not allowed. So this is a very simple technique, but I think it has really far-reaching ramifications in terms of getting to useful outcomes. And with this I come to uh, my conclusion. I hope I've been able to show you that it really is worth it to switch into creative more, mode more often in your meetings, but you should do so taking into account the latest developments in creativity research which say brainstorming does not work. Which also say you can't just switch into creative mode right away. It's always good to have a small warm-up, whether it's doing the paperclip exercise, doing the perspectives diagram where people can offload what's on their mind, whether it's doing an empathy map so you get into the perspective of your client. Um, doesn't matter, but a warm-up really matters. And then when it comes to producing ideas after you've prepared, you should at least switch from brainstorming to brainwriting. And in brainwriting, make sure people don't use fancy software, that they don't capture their ideas in PowerPoint and then share them to one another. It should look messy, it should look unfinished. The low perceived finishedness is key if you want others to build on your ideas. And if you want others to build on your ideas, it's really good to visualize them. And little tiny, you know, writings on post-it notes that won't do the job. We, we also studied post-it notes and we found they're not always conducive to creativity. People are more preoccupied with having their post-it note on the wall and everybody hear it than building on each other's contribution. And often you can't simply read it. So I think there's also great potential for software uh, like Let's Focus or others where you can visualize your ideas in a provisional manner and then uh, improve them collaboratively. And last but not least, Hang out with weirdos, have your ideas confronted with viewpoints of others, seek feedback often, regularly don't feel that you have to protect your idea. You do and you want to you know, be relentless in improving it, 
but you also want to stay open to feedback and suggestion as I am now and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. I'd love to. So please just free, free question. Just note that we are, um, you're being recorded. So, uh, um, you know, uh, so ask away with that knowledge. <laughs> you have a question? Yes, please. You mentioned uh, uh, often that you, the single setting your ideas down as an individual first is the, is the way to start creativity and then sharing it in dyads. Yes. I haven't heard the next step is that when do you involve a room like this if we were here to solve some problems that affected us all, how would you move to the next levels in terms of participation or do you? Yes, you do. And I think uh, the good old clustering approach still works, right? That, and there's great new tools where you can scale that up, where you have really, uh, you, s you can do crowdsourcing of ideas. And we're working actually on technology that once you've been in this huddle, in this uh, pair, you contribute your ideas electronically, for example, and then you can mine that, you can look for keywords, you can visualize that, you can cluster it. I totally agree with you, and I haven't gotten in, into that, that then we need the next step. Combining it, aggregating it, and very importantly, evaluating your ideas, right? And having common criteria to do so. And this is where, for example, group voting can con come into place, where you uh, use uh, online voting systems uh, on your s smartphone, where you can give people a voice of which ideas they think are, are worth pursuing. So I think the best process is start individually, then take it to, to the team of two, share it with the bigger group, and in doing so, try to combine ideas. Right? And then maybe go into other groups where you get feedback again, because that, that's also an area where technology can help us exposing our ideas to radically different communities where we get new input. So I completely agree with you, those later stages are crucial as well. And technology can help us with that. Think of all the social media functionalities where you can have your ideas commented upon, uh, improved. Unfortunately, I don't know about you, but my impression is not everybody on YouTube or Facebook follows the PPCO <laughs> <laughs> procedure, right? Uh, I think they're very big on the C, the concerns, and, but not really on the, the constructive part. And I think, uh, you know, for good creativity ecosystems to work, you need some common rules and standards of, of how to give feedback. And I hope that uh, in the future we'll be more careful about that. Thank, great question. Thank you very much. Yes? Just building on Louise's question there, um, you know, I think that, uh, that the idea of having different uh, software options and, you know, and, and looking into that is, is very productive, but I think equally or more productive is the value of a room like this yes. and building from that spot where you have ideas and twos to the dynamic of having uh, early feedback from yes. the whole room. And so I think that that one technique of, of the kind of rules for constructive criticism is, is useful, but I think that, that there might be more guidance that would be useful there on moving from the groups of twos uh, to the room dynamic and how you move forward. Yes. And you know, Dorothy Leonard has a lot of ideas with that, for example. Sure, yep. And I just want to mention two techniques that I think are very useful. Well, one is called World C Cafe, where you have people sit on tables much like yourself, but you have tablecloth that you can write upon, and then the facilitator stays, and then the, the participants move, and so you have a lot of reverberation in that, in that way as well, but with a bigger crowd. And the second one is just a simple marketplace of ideas, where you know, you and your partner, you develop, after you've ideated in a pair, you have a little sort of a poster, where you visualize your ideas and then there it's then it's walk around time and people can vote on your idea and you maybe you know you stand next to your poster and explain it to people like we do at scientific conferences and I think that's a great way to to have this reverberation take place just as a marketplace of ideas and then there are other techniques like Owen's open space uh, technology which I think is a wonderful thing or appreciative inquiry real-time strategic change teams integrity there's quite a few methods that work for a, for a bigger scale, and I think we will also see blended scenarios where we use technology although we're in the same room, just because it helps us be more efficient when it comes to capturing ideas or combining them. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very important uh, aspect indeed. Yes? Um, you commented about you know, hanging out with weirdos who really think differently and also diverse teams. Um, 
we're often working in uh, multidisciplinary teams. Can you talk about what you found or guidance of as you start to work with further, um, more and more diverse teams which have different jargons or languages yeah. or perspectives, especially on the technical side, but not always? Um, have you, what guidelines or what can you tell us about that? Yeah, I have one PhD student who works on this and what he has found is the research is quite clear. Interdisciplinary teams, teams where you have a lot of heterogeneity, are more creative, significantly more creative, if they can make it work, <laughs> right? <laughs> if there's cohesion. What's the m most important predictor for their success? Common passion for a common subject amidst all the, you know, the different perspectives. If they are rallied around a common purpose, then all the other stuff doesn't matter that much. The jargon. You know, the different priorities, different perspectives, uh, different roles that they have. But if they have a common passion for something, then uh, this, is, uh, this is the t determining factor. G in addition with clear accountability for each, contribu each one's contribution. You know, that there's sort of a peer pressure. Everybody knows what everybody else has to do. It cannot just be the leader. I think that's a, another second really important part, that you have clear accountability in such interdisciplinary work groups. And then thirdly, I think you have to get some, some things clarified. You have to establish clear um, team norms, especially in interdisciplinary teams, because they come in with different implicit assumptions, you know, about uh, punctuality and communication rules. So it pays to make that explicit and have this norming phase so that you don't prolong the storming phase uh, too, too much, right? So I think this rule setting uh, is important and it's not detrimental to creativity at all. It's just part of the housekeeping uh, that you have to do. Um, and, and sometimes, uh, I've been in the room where sometimes these different language uses create creativity, but more often than not, they also destroy it. I've been in a room where for half an hour, managers and engineers discussed quality issues. And only after half an hour did they find that when the engineers used the word quality, they were thinking of error-free and adhering to specifications, whereas the managers thought about cool design making it look like an Apple device, right? They had completely different understandings. And this is where, again, I think visualization can be of great help. Sketch out your ideas. It surfaces misunderstanding much quicker, right? And also it enables people to be critical in a more constructive manner. The magic thing, according, in, in my experience, when, you, when we're just having a conversation, especially in an interdisciplinary team, and I don't agree with you, I have to attack you and say, I, I, don't, I don't agree with you on that point. And I can't separate sort of the conflict f uh, from the issue, from the person. The moment you draw this, the, the dynamics completely change. I can then say, hey, look, this point here, I'm not so sure about this. And I'm separating my criticism of the issue from the person. And we've been able to show in one uh, article, in one experiment, this leads to much more constructive conflict. Because you won't feel attacked. Well, just have, it, you know, there's this thirdness. We just have a, a discussion about this point on the, on the whiteboard. And this small difference, in way of communicating makes a big difference in terms of the atmosphere and the, the idea improvement that you have. You had another question? Yes, at the back. Go, go right ahead. Yes, so um, my, I work in healthcare and creativity is completely dead there. And <laughs> I am trying to look at, it's not working, but when we're trying to bring up new ideas, the first first comment I hear back is, well, is there best practice to support your idea? And so how, I'm just looking for an idea or a suggestion, how do I, what is the rebuttal to that? <laughs> because best practice is what we have been doing which is not working. Yeah. We're looking for creative solutions which don't have the best practice yet. So I'm just wondering, like, how can I, uh, I'm really, this is something I'm really struggling with right now in terms of how do I get them to take into consideration new ideas that don't have the research behind it. Yeah, great question. I, I would answer first sarcastically by, you know, what many people call experience what they've done wrong for the last 10 years, right? A best practice is, is often a word to hide the fact that you haven't come up with anything better. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't believe in the notion of best practice because everything is contextual, needs to be adapted, needs to fit the situation, needs to fit the time, 
right? And, um, and so I would be very skeptical in using the, the, the term best practice. Maybe proven practices is okay. It has proven itself in one context, but it doesn't mean it has to be best in, in every uh, uh, other area. Um, sometimes it helps that you show that your idea has been applied in other areas. Right? It's also what De Bono advocates, lateral thinking, what Mintzberg advocates as seeing to decide that sometimes the best practices for your field actually come from outside your field. When IBM wanted to improve its order fulfillment system, they didn't look for best practices at Dell or HP or Acer. They went into the emergency unit of a hospital to learn how they do the triage of incoming patients quickly. Right? And so I, I think sometimes to be creative in a field, you really have to go beyond it and look outside. And, uh, and, and the best practices within your field are often outdated practices. They're not really I innovative. And, uh, and the, the best um, rebuttal to such a criticism would be, why not? You know, why not try something new? And, and of course, you need to provide eventually evidence. You need to test it. You need to go through uh, criticism. Um, but I think uh, this quest for the best practice, and we've always done it in this way, and this is how it's done, um, it's not very fruitful. I think your job is then to show what has changed since the best practice has been installed, why we need a change, you know, advocating that change is necessary. Because nobody likes change, as I mentioned, status quo bi a bias for the exception of a baby with a wet bottom. <laughs> nobody likes change, it's inevitable. So you have to sometimes uh, sell your idea, make your idea look attractive, make sure it survives the immune system of the organization. Yes? I'm curious uh, if you ever use mind maps uh, with a large group. Like I, I, I like the example that you gave about using it in groups of two and maybe having one to the left side and one on the right side and then switch. But do you find them productive with large groups? And if so, under what kind of conditions? No. I don't find mind maps very productive for group use. They confine you to one single way of working, which is going from high level to lower level ideas. I think that's not versatile enough for many ideation contexts. I think they're a great note-taking tool. I think they're great for your personal rapid idea structuring. I think they're good for pairwise ideation and then building on each other. I think they're also good for gathering a to-do list you know, with a projector uh, at the end of the meeting and have, have everybody validate that instantly. I think for that, they're great. But for many other constellations, I find it's, you're too fixed on having you know, just you can only create hierarchies, nothing else. Maybe some links between the ideas. But I know people are using it. My experience have not been that great because it is very restrictive, right? But I know people who use mind maps even for greater settings, and I know there are software packages that allow for collaborative mind mapping where you can add ideas anywhere, and I know they work both synchronously and asynchronously. But I'm not always sure that they provide enough flexibility. Right? But, that, that, but I haven't, as a t scientist, I haven't tested it. What I have tested, where we've run experiment, is about this aspect of mind maps. Whenever you give a pre-structured mind map, people feel less motivated, are less intensely working with it, than if they themselves create the mind map. That's, by the way, also my criticism, just to make a few more enemies on the go, uh, of uh, <laughs> graphic facilitation, right? which many say, oh, this is fantastic. We can be more creative as a team if we get a graphic facilitator into the room or a graphic scribe. I'm not sure, because people are not doing the drawing. It's somebody at the side of the room who's drawing. And I'm not sure that's the best way to ignite the imagination of people. I think what you do yourself, what you invent yourself, what you're engaged in, that's the best creativity catalyst you can have. Yes? I just want to ask the follow-up that mind map. You said that one person works on the left side while the other is working on the right and then they switch. Yes. Does, that, does that not provide some contamination though? Because you know, now I'm getting the half that someone else has worked on. Yes, indeed. But only after an initial phase where you just work on your own ideas. So there's no production blocking. There's no premature contamination. Because first, you're just focusing on your own half. You are, you are not looking... Um, um, okay, you're not looking at uh, the other person's work until you've completed your first ideation. And what we find is, you may have seen this also in your own work, that after a couple of minutes you're sort of empty, right? The fir at first uh, you, you get ideas quickly and then you, you sort of uh, fall into a, a productivity gap. 
And this is when we switch. And there, what we find is people are re-motivated. So people uh, can, again, be inspired by the ideas of their colleague. But first, they focus on their own ideas. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes? I'm participating as a patient in the program organized by the Minister of Health of having input. This is the latest policy of the Minister of Health in DC. And recently we had a meeting about relocation of the very important hospital in Vancouver, which is going to be relocated uh, with quite a distance. And we had a variety of means used for discussion, as you are saying. Okay. Uh, which was perfect for me. I have management background and I really enjoyed. But then there is the issue when those ideas are put together. Yes. When they are done by reasonably junior staff, they don't get the depth and comprehension of tons of materials all over the place plus recorded. And then you have, let's say, doctors coming in and imposing what they initially wanted as an outcome of it. How do you deal with that? Yes. Uh, I think it's a common problem, as you can see from uh, the reaction, and I think there's several issues in that. Let me just feed back one way how, for example, IBM has solved this. They also made the idea rating process a collaborative one. So they, they collected all the ideas, they clustered them, and then they gave it back to their employees online to rate them and prioritize them. And then they, then they shared very transparently, here's the employees' priorities, and then of course the management can differ from that but they have to explain the rationale, right? So you, you give sort of, you have a jury, like, like in the, you know, these contest tests, uh, Pop Idol, or I don't know how, what they're called. You have a jury, but then you also have the public vote, right? So you have qualified opinions, I think, which is important to hear, for people to hear, before they make their, their judgments. But you also harness the collective wisdom and, and sort of let them vote. But that's just a Swiss talking where we're very much brainwashed for democracy. And I know, <laughs> <laughs> and I know that it might not work uh, f for all contexts. I think when it comes to idea evaluation, there's nothing better than a good dialogue, you know, where the best arguments win. And um, this has worked well in many contexts, but I tell you where I've failed miserably uh, is in political contexts because th there there's so many hidden agendas and you can't always have an open dialogue and there's party loyalty and so many other issues. So their idea evaluation becomes, becomes really, really tough. And I think the context that you're talking about is also one where a lot of political agendas, uh, you know, come into, come into play. And I don't have a best practice or a recipe how to, how to deal with that other than to say, well, l let, let, let the best arguments surface let also people express what they feel, and then let's be transparent about it and, 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 and keep the debate going about the, the best ideas. And I think in this case, the final say has a decision maker, in this case being government. Okay, yeah. So yep. everything has to fit into the, their idea. Their agenda, yeah, and their resources, yeah, of course. Thank you, very challenging question. <laughs>